Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. So you want to be a network engineer. After all, designing the systems that connect billions of people worldwide is pretty awesome. In this video, we reveal everything you need to know about network engineering, what these engineers actually do, the dynamic technologies and practices, the absurd compensation, and the subtle secrets that make it so intriguing. It's time to discover what it means to be a network engineer and give it to you straight. This is the reality of network engineering. First, let's clear up the misconceptions and outline what a network engineer actually is. For perspective, every single message, video, or post that you have ever seen is only possible because of network engineers. They're like all controlling demigods of data, doing the behind the scenes work to breathe life into the hardware and software infrastructures that hold, send, and receive all of your messages and posts from around the world. Which is pretty cool, but what exactly is a network and how does it work? Basically, a network is an intricate web of protocols and devices that take digital or user inputs and applies its internal rules to produce an output depending on what instructions were given. Take my engineering workplace for example, we have a problem. We need to look up data sheets, send emails, and video call all the time. But we have hundreds of employees on our campus spread across multiple buildings with, like any company, proprietary information that we can't have our competitors or the general public seeing. Thankfully, we have network engineers. They use our company's network requirements to design the data communication protocols and systems that allow us to access years of legacy engineering documentation on the cloud, no matter where we are on campus, without any fear that malicious intenders will attack our data. Without network engineers, my coworkers, you, and I would have none of the digital privacy, let alone access to the expansive internet that we have today. Now, you might be starting to realize just how important and interesting this field can be. If so, just wait until we explore what these engineers actually do to bring networks to life through the lens of an Apple network engineer architecting the $5 billion Apple Park office and how much they're paid to do it. But before we get to these applications and the ludicrous salary, we need to explore how these engineers even enter the field in the first place. What curriculum do they spend years mastering in university? And do you really need to spend all that time and money in college to enter a network engineering career? Now, when considering if university is necessary, we need to recognize that network engineering is very unique when compared to other fields like mechanical, electrical, or chemical engineering, particularly in two ways. The first is found in the lab. Engineering labs are open-ended experiments in which students apply all the equations, theories, and philosophies with real-world circuits, equipment, and hardware. While other fields have dangerous and pricey lab setups, networking has lower stakes labs that you actually can start building right off your home Wi-Fi. There's also the option to simulate entire labs, hardware and all, on your PC. But actually familiarizing yourself with the hardware you're to use in the field is always the better option. The second big difference about network engineering, which also leans in favor of our home learner, is that certifications play a huge role in getting an entry level job and sustaining a career. There are a ton of foundational certifications, to which we'd recommend deeply researching and ultimately following whichever topics interest you the most. But if you're looking for a broad foundation with good job prospects, obtaining the Cisco CCNA is a great one to go for. To put it simply, it has the most bang for your buck, opening a ton of doors for entry level jobs while teaching real life hard skills that you'll use in the field. Links to info and other certifications can be found in the description below. So as we continue toward the intriguing curriculum of network engineering, remember that if you want to put in the long hours at your own home or find a middle ground with a local community college, it very much is possible to pursue network engineering career without the four-year degree. But no matter how you plan to learn network engineering, there is a free and easy way to start working towards a respected and lucrative engineering career. Brilliant. As an electrical engineer, I'm always nose deep in hardware and truth be told, getting a little rusty with my programming skills. Thanks to Brilliant, I've been able to brush up on my data structures and algorithms, which actually is refreshing tangible skills that I used to know, making me a more versatile and valuable engineer. But it doesn't stop there. Brilliant offers an engaging visual learning platform with intuitive lessons on how large language models work, math fundamentals, astrophysics and electricity and magnetism, and even eye-opening case studies on the algorithms behind going viral on X and unlocking rental value on Airbnbs. But maybe the best part is how flexible Brilliant is. As a full-time engineer and part-time YouTuber, extra time is hard to come by. Brilliant makes it super easy to learn on the go as it's tailored to my personal schedule and matches the perfect content right to my skill level and interests. So go and try out Brilliant right now for free for a full 30 days with the link in the description. The first 200 insiders also get 20% off Brilliant's annual subscription. Take advantage of this opportunity while you can. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video.
Now let's explore what these engineers actually learn before we get into the real network engineering and salaries inside the massive Apple park. The network curriculum is at a very unique intersection in the software computer engineering landscape. It involves a lot of hardware, but ultimately has been leaning more software oriented from the rise of software defined networking, network function virtualization, and cloud computing. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start with the basics in the curriculum and build the current technologies. Starting from the bottom, network engineering requires you to know what's going on under the hood, or rather inside the casing. Students get into exactly that in the computer engineering basics courses. They cover circuits, digital logic, how signals are actually stored on electronics, and more. After all, when I post this video on YouTube, its data is physically stored somewhere on YouTube servers as an array of ones and zeros awaiting true love's first click. When you, the first or 40,000th and first viewer of the video click on it, it is instantly recalled and all of those digital ones and zeros, represented by a high or low voltage, get bounced all the way around the world to end up navigating through your home Wi-Fi and firewalls to your streaming device, and finally translated back into our animation and audio that you've come to love just so much. Proving that storage, retrieval, and transmission of this data through hardware is extremely important. Computer engineering, circuit insight, latches, muxes, and flip-flops are all different tools to accomplish this organizing of data into data buses and transferring it from one place to the next. But once these basics are down, students must move on to a much more important course, Intro to Computer Networks. Students start learning LAN or local area networks, which are simple local networks like your home Wi-Fi setup, a floor of an office, or a small library at a university. They go through the features and functions of the basics like Ethernet and Wi-Fi, which are two of the most popular LAN technologies. They'll also delve into data packets and all of its intricacies, like what constitutes a viable data rate. After all, a million bits per second sounds like a lot, but that's not even fast enough for your standard Netflix stream, let alone trying to support even a small coffee shop. But debatably, the most important topic is the models that all of these technologies are built on, from how the user, you watching this video, get your data transported, the great network that hosts this data transmission, the actual hardware that holds all of the data, and the communications and connections that weave everything together. They also learn a ton of other networking topics and protocols like flow and congestion control, wireless networks, IP, transport methods and too many other concepts to cover in one video. Thankfully though, our students don't just cover theory. They apply all these concepts in various labs where students build web clients and servers, fully compatible network stacks that can run them, and test routing protocols and simulation. But they're not done there. Next, our students move on to the routing and switching course. This will typically follow along with the Cisco CCNA curriculum, learning about everything while well, switching and routing, unraveling the logistics of VLANs, inter-VLAN routing, and the protocols that actually move the data, like RIP2 and OSPF. Continuing with CCNA curriculum, we have Scaling and Connecting Networks, which are two courses that take networks to new heights. From the intricacies of LAN redundancy and aggregation to the nuances of wireless LAN configuration, students figure out how to deal with the challenges of scaling networks efficiently and effectively. A local network in my little apartment is one thing, but could you imagine securely and efficiently connecting an entire 12,000 employee company? These engineers have their work absolutely cut out for them, as we'll soon see with the Apple Park. But on the other hand, connecting networks shifts the view from growing out networks to interconnecting them, with topics like point-to-point -point connections, frame relay, and broadband solutions in wireless area networks rather than local. But all of this would just be a bunch of hogwash without security. Students take a number of network and cybersecurity courses that cover how to safeguard everything from corporate email systems to cloud storage from the threat and vulnerabilities of unauthorized access. The course mirrors that of the Security Plus certification, getting into authentication methods, different types of cyber attacks to prepare for, virtual private networks, and configuring your very own firewalls, cryptography, web security, and even physical security. At the end of the degree, students mesh all their network insight together in a final capstone course, using everything they learned in real field experiences in establishing, maintaining, and troubleshooting networks. These could be local business settings, school districts, your college's labs, or any number of other real world opportunities. But maybe the best part of this capstone course is creating a network of humans, not digital devices, that launch students right into their lucrative tech careers, an opportunity tougher to acquire if you don't get the degree. 
Now there are a ton more relevant math, physics, and engineering classes that you can expect to see in a network engineering degree, but the ones we covered are pretty much the must-haves, with slight variation between universities. If you want more information on the curriculum, make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment letting us know, because now it's time to examine the real-life application of network engineering in Silicon Valley's very own Apple Park, discovering the network engineer's day-to-day -day tasks and arriving at how much these engineers actually make. The story starts with the mothership. More commonly known as Apple Park is a four-story architectural behemoth that serves as the engineering hub for one of the most renowned and successful brands and technology companies of all time. But this $5 billion architectural masterpiece comes with another artistic application of engineering, and we're not talking about the interior design. In over 2.8 million square feet of office space that houses more than 12,000 employees, there is a lot of connectivity to be accounted for. Thankfully, Apple hired a head network engineer that can mastermind this massive network that withstands the immense traffic of the largest tech company's largest office. Let's call this network artist George, as his name isn't publicly available. Now, before any construction even begins, George has to examine the layout of each individual office space, conference room, R&D lab, and fitness center to ensure that there are enough wireless access points. You know, those little round Wi-Fi supply devices? Yeah, those ones. You see, every Apple employee or guest is ideally connected to at least three wireless access points at all times for triangulation of connectivity and triangulation of location finding. This is the first job of a network engineer, ensuring that there are enough access points so that every single nook and cranny of the entire structure will be accounted for and connected. For years, I paid little to no attention to these access points and where they actually lead and took my sweet interrupted Wi-Fi for granted. But of course, these access points lead to somewhere and that somewhere is an IDF closet. IDF, or Intermediate Distribution Facility, closets are the first goldmine of network engineering hardware. George had a field day designing this one. He started by tallying how many access points and ethernet connections are routed to this closet and roughly how many employees those connections support. From there, he can source and purchase all the amazing hardware filling the room. First, he's got network switches, a network engineer's bread and butter, which simply allows each line communication with all the other lines. He also sources and orders an interruptible power supply, cooling systems in the panels that hold everything, the physical security for the room, and the other physical logistics of the closet. But wait, if this is an intermediate distribution facility, where's the main one? Well, this IDF and the expected dozens or hundred others in the Apple Park are all routed with fiber optic cables to the all-powerful main distribution facility of the entire 2.8 million square feet of office space. Yes, the central connectivity hub for the entire park. Now, we are really talking some serious hardware. This single room is so important that without it, the entire office space would literally have the connection power of an early 1800s office. Yeah, none. That's why it's so important that George fills the estimated 10,000 square foot space with only the top of the line high density patch panels, switches, power supplies, firewalls, and security measures. For these 12,000 employees, we're probably talking over 500 individual switches, 22 megawatt hours of power every day, and somewhere between six and $10 million just to purchase all of this equipment. Man, the AC units alone are in the ballpark of $300,000. Now, masterminding this entire physical network from each individual ethernet port to the all powerful MDF and beyond is no easy task, much more than just one engineer can handle. But that's only half of it, maybe even less. The entire software network stack of communication protocols, firewalls, clearances, bandwidth allocations, and a ton more features needs to be implemented within the MDF, all the IDFs, and each individual printer, computer, and device that enters the building. This is one of the primary calls to network engineering. Many want the work from home, flexible, high paying careers of tech, but cringe at the idea of sitting behind a computer for the rest of their life. Not only do network engineers get the flexible, lucrative benefits of tech, but also get to handle and route equipment, discuss specifications with the people who actually will use the network, and meet and work with vendors to discuss everything from new top of the line switches to massive air conditioning equipment. Well, depending on the job that is. If you want, many network engineers work completely remotely as well, which is obviously really awesome, but how much do these network engineers make? It does depend on which diverse subfield you end up in, which if you wanna know more, make sure to like, subscribe, and let us know in the comments. 
But in general, US-based network engineers make an average of $109,000 a year, with our Apple network engineers making over $220,000 a year on the high end. Anyways, find out why you actually might not want to be a computer engineer here, or check this other computer engineering subfield, Embedded Systems Engineering, right here. Thanks for watching, and happy engineering, everybody!